everybody to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Marketing Manager, and I'll be your host today. Today's program is sponsored by the Michigan League of Hand Weavers. They've been a great sponsor of Textiles and Tea, and we really appreciate their sponsorship. Learn more about them at mlhguild.org. We will take questions today, as always. It'll be the last 15 minutes of the program. We'll get to as many questions as we can, but please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. They're just, I just can't see them if they're in the chat. Love your comments though, keep those coming. Today, we have Carol Irving. Carol was driven by a love for the materials she employs. Carol weaves bright and stimulating images into her rugs. In her work, she seeks to convey her passion for fiber, color, and design. She brought those together in excellent craftsmanship, as you'll see as we look at her work. She weaves her richly colored yarns on a loom, much the way people have been weaving for years. Each rug is a totally different, unique piece of American craft. Her designs range from very contemporary and geometric to organic shapes and images. This statement from her is, I'm committed to excellent craftsmanship so that my rugs are not only functional, but pleasing to look at. Her work is striking when hung on the wall, visually bold from a distance and tactile in its intricate detail. Hey, Carol. Hi. Welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hi, Kathy. First question, what is your favorite tea? Well, I'm drinking some out of my Albuquerque rug <laughs> mug, and I usually like the uh, Celestial Seasoning uh, tea. This one's Bengal Spice. Or a oh, I love that one. That's my, one of my favorites. It's hard to find around here for some reason. So I want to start with how did you get started in fiber? Well, uh, a lot like other fiber artists and weavers, um, my grandmother, she taught me how to knit. I was pretty young and um, I probably didn't take it very far, but I do remember sitting with her <clears throat> and learning how to knit. I'm left-handed and so was she. And so we had that in common, although I don't think I knit left-handed. Um, but from there, um, in high school, I had a good friend that was weaving on a uh, frame loom that she had built. And that was the first time I'd seen anything like that. Um, kind of freestyle, freeform weaving. And um, I had built one. And then later on in college, even though I was majoring in botany, I, um, I took another weaving class and um, built another frame loom and uh, things just kind of started from there. Well, I, I love how you consistently talk about your work as it can be a rug or it can be a wall hanging. How did you choose to focus on rugs or did rugs choose you? Um, I think it was a, a mutual exchange. Um, I started off, like many weavers do, taking a lot of classes, workshops, a little of this and a little of that. <clears throat> and then I um, moved to New Mexico after I got my degree. And um, I studied here in Michigan. My husband got his first job in New Mexico and we lived there. And um, a good friend of ours had a loom he was selling and it came with all the equipment, a bench, um, everything you'd need to get started. And I uh, bought it, I think the whole thing for $300 and taught myself how to weave pretty much. Um, and the thing I was most drawn to were rugs, larger sized items. So that's, that's pretty much how I got started. Oh, well, if I, um, sorry, I'm getting kind of bubble here. If an artist sees themselves, well, we've asked this several times, do artists see themselves as um, artists, artisans, or craftspeople? Um, and with your whole spectrum of from wall hangings to rug, the wall hangings are usually considered more art. The rugs are usually considered more craft. Where would you see yourself on that continuum? Or do you see yourself in that continuum at all? I think I see myself as a craft 
person. I really like to fine tune what I do, um, but I do like to elevate um, a rug from something very utilitarian. For some reason, putting it up on the wall, <clears throat> something that just becomes visible because if I show them and people look at them, they go, well, you're not gonna put that on the floor, are you? <laughs> And I'm like, well, they are sturdy enough to go on the floor, but if you prefer, they certainly can go on the wall. So um, I'm a member of the American Craft Council. Um, I had a quote um, from Peter Collingwood. Uh, I was reading an interview from him recently, and he said that he is passionate about technical competence. And I would have to agree with that. Um, that drives me, process drives me, um, and technical confidence. That's interesting, technical confidence, yeah. Well, we'll see that in your work. Your work is amazing in that way. Um, and speaking of Peter Collingwood, um, you took a workshop with him and were, was introduced into um, um, more about rugs and working with rugs. So how do you think um, he and his work impacted on your work? Well, I took that class um, back in the, I think it was the late 1980s. <clears throat> it was a multi-day class um, and it was on basic uh, rug weaving techniques. And then later on in the class, we learned a little bit about shaft switching. And that pretty much nailed it for me. Um, it was soon after that I bought my uh, shaft switching rug loom from Harrisville. So um, that, that was the determining factor for me. Well, the series of works called uh, Weaver's Journal of Endangered Wildflowers shows um, these, this triptych of these beautiful uh, wildflowers and it shows your passion for botany. Um, would you talk some about this series and how this came about and what your background is in botany? Yeah, so when I got my degree uh, back in the 70s, I actually have two, um, two bachelor's degrees earned at two different times in my life. But anyway, the first one, I had a major in botany um, and my love was taxonomy and um, searching for wildflowers. Um, I even did a, uh, a study in Arizona in the desert and um, kept journals, taking, doing drawings, things like that. And um, back in, um, oh, when was it? 2014, I think, <clears throat> our local art center and the woman, she's a, a really good friend of mine, and she was the director and um, she kind of challenged me and I wrote an article about it. So it's in um, handwoven uh, the September, October 2020 issue, if anybody wants to read it. Um, but it was all about this challenge. So if I could produce a series that was large enough to go on the walls of the gallery, um, she would put it up. And so it took me two years. I started in um, 2016, I think, and um, <clears throat> it was first exhibited there in 2018, January of 2018, and I'm um, pretty proud of it. It's been to quite a few places. In fact, it's going very soon down to Ann Arbor. Um, at the at U of M, their hospital system has a um, exhibiting uh, art gallery. And so the whole series got accepted to be exhibited there. Oh, that's amazing. It's beautiful work. And how many pieces were in it? There's 12, 12 panels all together. Wow. And they're all about, what are the size? I know somebody's going to ask this. What are yeah. the size ranges? Um, most of them are three by five feet. And there's one that is uh, three by about two and a half feet. Then there's also, yep, I also a set of, um, I call them interpretive notebooks that go along with the exhibit. And they show notes and maps where you could find the uh, wildflowers, um, notes while I was weaving the pieces, 
Um, just all kinds of stuff, just to give you a better idea about the wildflowers, what you can do to uh, minimize um, endangered species, all those kinds of things. Oh, that would have been great to have all that information to go with the weavings too. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a lot of work, 12 pieces in two years. The, the size of those pieces, that's amazing. That's really amazing. It, it took me about a month from, I did them piece by piece by piece. So when I finish one, then I start um, researching and designing the next one. And, did, um, did you ever feel like, oh, I just can't keep doing this? <laughs> <laughs> it makes well, so I, was, about it. <laughs> I was working full time besides while I was working. Oh, wow. So it was funny. I would come home from work and try to relax and have dinner. And then about 7.30 was my, my check-in time. And my studio at that time was above the garage. And so I, you know, kind of look at my watch and go, oh, 7.30, got to go. And I stay up there for a couple of hours. And got it done. Well, good for you. Wow, that's amazing. Well, one of the things I want to talk about in, in doing this work, you used a process called shaft switching. Um, and we've got some images here. And I, if you could just take a few minutes, I don't want to get into a whole workshop here, but explain to folks, um, this is Peter Collingwood's um, his does his idea of being able to shift sh swift switch shafts <laughs> hard to say um and this is a loom actually made by harrisville correct it is made by harrisville but it was in conjunction with peter collinwood it's right it was his baby his his yes. design would yes. you share some with us how this works so people will understand Sure, I will, but I do want to um, point out that there's a great video that the folks at Harrisville put out um, all about this rug loom and all its features and definitely giving credit to Peter Collingwood. So if anybody's interested in how it works or its features, um, it's worth looking for. But um, in its basic um, theory, if you can imagine a floating cell, a uh, floating warp thread, most of us know what that is if you're a weaver. Um, it's a warp thread that goes through the reed, but it doesn't go through a heddle. And so it's just kind of laying there. So imagine that floating warp thread and there's an empty heddle, let's say on, on harness one and harness four next to it, sandwiching it. And so you can see in the uh, photo on the left side, those are the levers. And then attached to the levers is Texol cord. Texol cord, I wish I had a piece of it here. Texol cord is a cord that has, it's almost like, like nylon chain. So it has mm -hmm. holes in it. So that warp thread, that one I'm calling a floating, goes through the Texol not through any of either of those pedals. And that lever system, see the levers there uh -huh. above my hand. Um, <clears throat> as you switch those levers, pushing them either forward or towards yourself, that moves that Texol and it kind of attaches that floating salvage to, either, to one of the pattern um, pedals. So in my case, it's a one or a four. So it's a it's a block technique, except that all the blocks are the same. You thread the same units all the way across. Well, it's interesting that you you're using the term of block because my next question for you is that you've taken this shaft switching system and kind of made it your own. Because when I think of shaft switching and when you look at Peter Collingwood or Jason Collingwood's work, it's very much blocks, um, very complicated and uh, this is a great system, but yours are much more um, pictorial. Um, it's got more curves to them and there's a more of a flow, organic, however you wanna say it, such as these two works, which is Sunset Silhouette um, 
and then on the right and then waterfall two on the left. Yeah. So was there like an aha moment when you started working with that you thought to yourself, I, I can take this a different way. I can do this a little bit different than the norm. Yeah, I, I don't know if there was an aha moment. <laughs> I would say um, the piece on the left, which is waterfall, that still has that pixelated look to it. Um, as opposed to the um, sunset silhouette on the right hand side. But I think I really figured out how to get more organic shapes when I was doing the wildflowers because I was forced into getting those organic shapes by um, not changing the, the block as often as I would have previously. Um, or changing it more often to get a, a more rounded or organic shape. So it's not anything I read about. I just kind of figured it out. Yes. Uh, it's just amazing how soft and flowing and round uh, your images are. I, it's just uh, gorgeous. Um, you have. Um, you're pretty well known for your use of color. And those two images were a great example of that. But you also do amazing, bold black and white works, such as these two, which is, yeah. make sure I have these in the right order. The one on the left is black and white, and the one on the right is black and white obsession too. No, I think it's the opposite. So the one <laughs> on the left is black and white obsession. Okay. Or obsession two. And the one on the right, is just black and white. In fact, the one on the right is the very first black and white that I did. Oh, really? Yeah, so there's a, I've been working on this series for a long time um, and I just it just keeps evolving. Um, it started off with three panels that I was getting ready for, I don't know if you're familiar with the art show in Grand Rapids, Michigan, it's called Art Prize. It's a, it's a huge, huge deal. I encourage anybody to Google it and look it up. But um, it was I actually on a Sunday afternoon, it was rainy, I was up in the studio, I used, um, I was using uh, computer software for designing and just making marks, you know, on the screen, not really with any intention. And um, I just kept going with that until I found one that was pleasing to me. And then the next two panels after that were basically the same design, but just kept going with that, making it more complicated with each panel. So I've just continued with that for each one since then. I keep keep working with it, um, using more color, but just a touch of color. I don't want mm -hmm. to necessarily immerse a lot of color in there. Well, I've heard people talking about how sometimes going to black and white impacts on how they use color. Did you find that the more you used black and white that it changed how you looked at color? No, not necessarily. I was um, inspired to just use colors that I felt fit the design and, and the boldness of the black and white. You know, when you're working, yeah, it's, I don't know if this is the uh, definition of feng shui, but it's, it just feels right. You know? Right. Yeah. So you mentioned, because um, I'm sure somebody's going to ask this, so I'll just go ahead and ask it now. <laughs> so you use um, computer to do most of your designing or do you draw do it ahead of time? Um, I started off using graph paper. Um, cause that's all I had, graph paper, colored pencils, crayons, whatever I could. And then, um, eventually I went to Excel spreadsheet and, uh, that worked really? pretty well too. Yeah. In <laughs> fact, um, I don't know if you can go back to that slide, but, um, one of the earlier slides right in the beginning, it shows like a moon or a sun in it. That one was designed on Excel. And then, um, there's quite a few. Uh, yeah, that one. That, huh. That's two panels, each one being three by five. 
So the Excel spreadsheets actually lend themselves really well to that. But then I discovered some software that I use, Stitch Painter is what it's called. Stitch and I know, Painter? Yeah, I know okay. there's um, quite a few other uh, fiber artists and um, chef switchers that use it also. Huh, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Well, the more I interview artists, the more I'm amazed how many have a science or a math background. Now you have botany, and but you also work as an accountant, so you have the math. So what do you think the connection is between math and science and weaving? It is uncanny because I think I've seen every HDA uh, or textiles and tea interview. Um, and some have the background, it's uncanny how many have a background in sciences or math. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's attention, the characteristics um, of either an accountant or somebody that works in the sciences, um, attention to detail, um, organizational skills, those types of things mm -hmm. that cross over from and, and it, to me, weaving is very technical and it uses a lot of my math skills. Who knew I'd be yeah. using algebra to determine, do I have enough yarn to, fig to finish this project? Um, I use it all the time. So. Yeah, I guess I took Jason Collingwood's um, workshop. I didn't have the fortune to take Peter, but I remember thinking, this is a lot of math. <laughs> so, uh, I, I could see how it would be, um, it would really enhance or at least help you if you had a strong um, feeling for math or an affinity for math. Yeah. So, the other thing I was, I was looking through your website and reading your bio and, and I was struck that you have gone from like weaving hotbed to weaving hotbed. Like you've been in uh, New Mexico, you were in Oregon and now Michigan. All of those have a real strong weaving background, um, history, population. Um, so how do you think a change in geography going to those places impact you or your work? Um, I don't know if those places because of their geographic or um, especially New Mexico with its fiber and weaving history impacted me so much. I think we're all impacted by all so many things in our lives, you know, our education, our family, our marriages, our relationships, all those things grouped together form who we are and what we are at this point in our lives. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily those geographic locations. Um, and where I am right now in Escanaba, Michigan, it's certainly not the hotbed of, of fiber art. <laughs> There's a few of us, but, um, you know, we, we live pretty solo lives in our studios or basements or garages and, um, just get do the thing we, we enjoy the most. Well, I, I hear of all the artists from Michigan and like your sponsor today, the um, League of Hand Weavers from Michigan. It just seems like there's such a strong community there, but you're right, it's probably a very big state. Y'all are probably very It is a very big state. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with what it looks like. There's what we call the lower peninsula and the upper peninsula and I live in the upper peninsula oh, okay it's, it's pretty rural um we have a great art center though and uh, shout out to the Boniface so. <laughs> good gotta promote those yeah okay so I have a, a, a what if question for you okay you are fleeing your studio you can only take one thing. Doesn't matter how big or how heavy, you can take one thing. Other than your loom, what do you think you would grab? Um, I think I would take my journal that I keep as I'm weaving because they contain all the information. Um, I've been keeping journals since I started. They're not um, 
very organized. <laughs> they're, they're date organized, I will say that. And um, they usually have yarn samples of beginning and ending dates, um, things like that. All the things I would need, I think, to if I ever had to redo a project, all the information is there. So one so of the things on my bucket list is to um, recompile all of it into a better system. I think you should make a book. <laughs> That'd be a great book. <laughs> so is your your journal, like some people do a journal and they have like personal stuff in there as well as their art stuff. Do you do it like that or is your strictly? No, art? it's strictly project orientated. Okay. So do you find that you, you walk around and you see something and you're like, oh, that's cool looking and you either take a picture and put it in your journal or you take it and put it in your journal I do, or I do take a lot of photographs but they're not I don't print them and put them in my journal okay. they're just kind of you know either on my system or on my google drive or something like that so the ones that I really think I might do something with um which I have been doing with um so we moved, we built a house and moved in in 2019. And then, of course, COVID set in. But um, it's right on Lake Michigan. And we have amazing sunrises and amazing sunsets. And um, so I've been trying to take lots of photographs, keeping them in an inspiration folder. And um, I've been using some of them. There's, you know, I've been leaving some of them already. So keep going with that. Well, that kind of leads into my next question, which is what's next for you? It sounds like the sunsets might be the next series coming up for you, but what else is next for you? Um, a good friend of mine has challenged me to work outside of the block and I'm, she, that's all she said. And um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of something possibly still using chef switching but leaving the surface so it's not just a smooth surface. Um, definitely wall hangings, you wouldn't be able to put this on the floor. Um, but something, I'm not sure what, but that's what I'm thinking of. So it'd be more three dimensional kind yes. of thing? Yep, yep, more three dimensional. So well, in near, to... go ahead. No, I was gonna say you'll have to come back when you get done. Yeah. Yes, definitely. That's what you did. So do you have a timeline? Did she give you a timeline on this? No, or? it's very open-ended. Okay. She's, she's always uh, egging and noodling me and, you know, what are you, what are you making to put in this show and that show? And so we kind of do that for each other and it really helps. Is she watching today? I, I think, think so. <laughs> well, whoever you are, good job. We can't wait to see what happens. <laughs> Well, let's ask some questions from our audience. How about that? Great. All right. Um, Janet Frank wants to know, do we have dates for the Ann Arbor exhibit? Um, Is that the prize that you were talking about? That's the, um, uh, they call it gifts of art in the uh, U of M hospital system. Uh, March, 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 I thought I had it in my notes. Um, I did post on Instagram about it. If anybody follows me there, middle of March till uh, sometime in May, I believe. Will you be part of that exhibit? Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. <clears throat> Is that a yearly uh, exhibit? Um, it's. They take, they have multiple, I think they have like nine galleries in their hospital system. And um, they're always looking for artists. And so they have kind of a rotating, you know, you enter and you, your work might get accepted or not. And um, so they have a rotating system that they do. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, if, you, if you Google gifts of art, uh, U of M, you'll probably find the program. Um, can you just, this is from Sherry Davis. Can you describe the process of card weaving your selvages? Card weaving. 
Um, I don't do that. Um, truthfully, oh, okay. I don't even know how to do that. I've seen <laughs> seen others' uh, pictures of it, and I know of uh, other weavers that do it, but I couldn't speak about it. Well, at least three people have asked this question. Would you talk about the pieces behind you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there's three there. Um, they are woven in the other orientation. And then when I and then when I took them off the loom, I turned them around. So <clears throat> the one in the middle is called Elements of Thistle because it's I don't know if you can see it. It's mostly yeah. purples and greens. And then the other two, there it is. Um, I was using the palette of a good friend of mine, um, Cindy. Um, we were supposed to have an exhibit together and uh, it got canceled. Guess why? Because of COVID. And we were going to be, <clears throat> she's a, uh, She's a felter and a painter and a ceramic artist. And she, we were gonna combine, um, I was gonna try and use some ceramic beads and incorporate them in my weaving. And it just never materialized, unfortunately. So those are the weavings by that. So those are her color palette from some of her paintings. So well, that's interesting. That it's interesting that you did it, you like you, you wove it horizontal and then you turned it vertical, right? Yeah. That's great. I love those. Thank you. And obviously everybody else does too. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, Judy Fruiterman wants to know, um, do you, is there a particular yarn that you like? Do you use mostly wool? Do you use variety? Well, the warp that I use is linen. It's an A5 linen. Okay. Um, and the weft I use, I usually use three strands of a, <clears throat> excuse me, two ply wool or a, like the Collingwoods um, produced a rug wool that sold, sold during, uh, through different uh, weaving outlets, but Webs carries it. Mm -hmm. And it's a two ply, but theirs is a, um, I think it's mostly wool with a touch of nylon in it. But I also get a lot of mill ends to try and keep my pricing down. Um, Helen Flannery would like to know, are there any designers who particularly influence your work? And are you at all influenced by the Bauhaus designs? She said the lovely black and white weavings remind her of Annie Albers work a bit. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I'd have to say they're inspirational, um, but um, Collingwood's, both Jason and Peter Collingwood, very much so. Um, I'm very inspired to the black and white. Um, I'm, I'm drawn to works of uh, indigenous people. Mm. And, um, and that not just uh, Northwest or yeah, Northwest, uh, Indians, but African art. And I think the black and whites are kind of an inspiration or not to those designs without copying them. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of inspirations, uh, Robert Sobech, Sobech, sorry, Robert, but how would you compare your work to traditional tapestry weaving or Navajo weaving? Well, the, <clears throat> my work is different or shaft switching is different than tapestry. And I think that's part of what uh, Peter Collingwood's motivation is that the shuttles go from edge to edge as opposed to tapestry mm. where you're working in areas and your yarn is only going from here to here, and then you might start another color area. My shuttles, and I'm usually using two shuttles at the same time, alternating them as they go, um, <clears throat> they go from edge to edge. Although I've started to incorporate some inlay technique. So the tapestry artists among us will um, recognize inlay. Um, it's a way to incorporate more colors 
in the uh, chef switching uh, image. It's more um, time consuming too, of course. Yeah. Oh, Karen Holm wants to know the name of the software that you use. Yep, it's called Stitch Painter. Stitch Painter. Yes. Okay. Um, it's put out by a company by, um, called Cochneal. Cochneal? Is that how you pronounce that? Uh -huh. Just like the dye or the bug? Yeah. Um, do you, oh, this is a great question. Daryl and Davini. Divine, <clears throat> do you sample with a smaller format before you do your bigger projects? Smaller, no, I don't. Okay. It doesn't lend itself that way. Um, I've tried to, in fact, go the other way from large to small because each unit of the woven structure is pretty much like a half an inch by a half an inch. It just doesn't lend itself to weaving small. You can't shrink that image down. Um, going back to our last question, we posted in chat um, how to get the um, stitch painter from Cochineal. So yep, if y'all want some more information. Yeah. So y'all, that will be there. Lori Angle says, I'm opening a healing art center in Harbor Springs in the near future and would love you to show your work. No. no Is that in Michigan? It's... Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. It's still quite a ways away. Harbor Springs is near Petoskey. Uh, it's two and a half to the bridge and probably another hour and a half. So, but doable. Um, Karen LeBlanc wants to know, can you adapt any loom for shaft switching technique? Thanks. You can. In <laughs> fact, um, I'm going to, this Saturday, I'm going to be teaching online. This will be my first online class. Um, well, it's not teaching. It's more of a presentation. But um, showing them how you can turn any loom into a shaft switching technique. Um, well, it's not the best situation, but you can do it. You can. I, like I said, I've taken a couple of workshops in it. So Olivia Hicks. Hi, Olivia. Um, there's your answer. So go check out um, her workshop. Is it is on your website? Um, well, the, the presentation is a closed presentation to a group out in California. Okay. Um, but if she would like instruction, in fact, right before COVID started, I was just about to launch uh, in-studio, in-house instruction for people. I have a guest room, guest bathroom, everything is like brand new. And um, of course, then COVID came mm. and um, I just didn't do that at all. I haven't had anybody at all, but I'm hoping this summer, I've got two people who want to come for a face-to-face -face for this summer. So I'm hoping we'll be able to do that. Well, good. We're all gonna sign up. <laughs> <laughs> um, couple of people are asking, Lisa and Kathy are asking about your weave structure. Do you normally just do plain weave? Do you use twill, rose path? No, it's a, it's a block. Um, I started off with a three unit block um, and now I'm using a four. I actually have a whole new shaft switching uh, mechanism. Um, mm. I started off with a three quarter inch when I bought the uh, loom and then they came out with a half inch. So you get more levers and you have a little bit more design capability because it's smaller. Um, but the structure is more like a summer and winter structure and mm. it's reversible. So whatever you have or see on the one side, the top side, it's the exact opposite on the bottom. Um, how do you mount your pieces to hang on the wall? This is from Allison Grove. Um, I have gone through quite a number of hanging devices and the one I'm currently using 
is I buy it from an outfit. I think they're out west, Colorado, and I think they're called Lazy River. And they primarily um, work with the Navajo weaver. Um, and it works because the fiber is wool mm. and it's Velcro on a wooden um, piece of wood. And the Velcro sticks right to the, uh, the back of the woven piece. And then there's wire for hanging it right there. Uh, Mandy, we have a request here, if you don't mind. <laughs> Mandy is the behind the scenes woman. Uh, people want to know about the flower panel. They were saying, okay. is it a lacy finish? Um, they said it went too fast. And then uh, Nan Holberg wants to know, is there a catalog for the flower series? No, I don't have a catalog. Okay. But so it's there's on my website. So there's the pieces. And I think. And so yeah, what's the question? She wanted to know if there was a lacy finish to it. I think no, it's those, are, the, those are braids. And I think the edge has got a little bit of the color that kind of makes it look like it's broken up some. Yeah. Um, oh, what is that called? There, I use a two-stranded. It's really not part of the weaving. Um, it's not sumac. Now I can't think of it. It's a, it's, Peter Collingwood teaches it, and it's in his book, uh, both books. But that's how I start and end all my weaving. And this was all shaft switching, right? Yeah. Okay. That was yep. the other question from Nan. Was was it shaft switching? Yeah, um, I used to. I used to end and and start almost all my weaving with the braided end for the warps, and I've um, I've changed that for the most part um, for a, a cleaner finish. I weave the ends in now. I do um, a row of Damascus knots. Oh, okay. You know what that is, and if you don't, check out Peter Collingwood's book. <laughs> and everything is there. It, it truly is like the Bible. It really is. I mean, if you want well, to know anything, it's in great detail. And and just so viewers know, you can view it or download it as a PDF for free on handweaving.net. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. okay. It's both, both of his weaving, his uh, rug weaving books are there. Oh, that's great because they're out of print. That's wonderful. Yeah. Speaking of which, there he is. Thank you, <laughs> Mandy. Um, you got another shout out here. Your botanical rugs would look beautiful in the Booth Bay, Maine Botanical Gardens. Bring them to Maine. And this is from okay. Susan Bacuch Bacuzzo. Yep, tell her to uh, send me an email. She can do it through my website. There's a form there. Connect us. That's all I need. There you go. Um, is your shaft switching device three quarter or a half? And you may have answered this. I, I did. It's, it's now a half. I had a three quarter okay. and I sent it back to them and they reconfigured it. So when you first started weaving, you I'm assuming you didn't have the shaft switching loom to start with. What did you start on? I started with that loom that I got in New Mexico. Oh, that um, one? Yes. Yep. And then after that, you went to the... Um... It was a four harness loom. So it was the first time I would woven on a, you know, multi-shaft loom. And I, I don't think that, I think he might have given me some books. And um, I just went with it from there and I taught myself. And now I have more looms. I have a Norwood, I have a, uh, a pup, an eight harness pup, and then I have a, uh, an Orco, four harness Orco that needs to be put in working condition. It's kind of sad right now. Well, you were talking about when you did the flowers that you did one, then you went to the next one, and then you did that one. So with this many looms, do you have projects going on at a different, on each loom? I don't too much. No. Um, it's really hard to do that because you just get going. Um, I'm all about focus. I really am. Um, and that's what I like to do. So 
Um, I feel if I have too much going on, on too many moons or whatever, I feel distracted and uh, unable to give the attention I need to the project I'm working on. Oh, I can understand that. That's amazing. I did uh, take some time off um, around Christmas time. I did it last year and I did it this year and um, put uh, eight two cotton on the Norwood, uh, like 20 yards and uh, did dish towel. They're great gifts and great items for donation. And oh, good. They're just fine. Well, that was Kathy Roy. Hi, Kathy. That was her question. Do you weave anything other than weave structures? Uh, weave any other weave structure, sorry. Oh, any other weave structures? Well, like I said, I just did those um, those towels. And in my past, I did, you know, yardage for clothing, um, things like that. And then once I got the rug loom, that, that pretty much, I like to focus, like mm -hmm. I said. Um, I get an idea in my head on what I want to do, and I just go forward with it. So I put about 20 yards of linen on the loom each time I warp it. Um, and I- 20 yards? Do it from a, yeah, wow. do it from a warping board and and warp front to back. And um, I'm now doing it where I can, um, I leave like a dummy warp in the heddle and the reed and I can just tie on. So now I don't have um, threading mistakes and uh, just pull it through. It's a little difficult, but you can do it. Oh, that's amazing. Good for you. And um, Nan Solomon wants to know, do you always use linen for your warp? For my warp, yep, I do. Um, Lynn Hughes wants to know, how did you find, oh, she said she went to look for um, handweaving.net. I think, um, but she didn't think, see it. Yeah, I think Mandy posted the whole address. See if she she should look there. Okay. In the chat. All right. Um, and if you oh, just this. Google, if you just Google Peter Collingwood, uh, PDF or something like that, it'll pop up. Okay. Uh, Barbara wants to know. Um, once you finish a project, are you on to the next one quickly? Do you have the next one in your head or do you need to take a break or? Um, I do try to get on to something quickly. Um, I find if I wait too long, I, I lose that drive. So I do like yeah. to uh, come up with something. I have ideas rolling around, but not fully formed. So sometimes I have the very next project all ready to go. It's uh, printed off the printer and that's what I use for my uh, cartoon. Um, but oftentimes I go from cutting off a rug, finishing it, and then to uh, designing, so. Well, you're still working, right? No, I'm retired. Are you really? Yeah, I'm retired you. March of 2019. Oh, okay. Okay. So do you weave every day? Every day you're up and in the loom room? And I am either here in my studio or I have an office space um, and doing things weaving related. Um, you know, if you want to get into shows, there's a lot of work related to that. Um, I need to upgrade my website. Um, I don't know if people are aware of a, um, an app, I'll call it an app or a website called Artwork Archive, but I show my work there. Um, it's got a really nice interface. Um, Artwork Archive? Yes, Artwork, one word, uh, Archive. Okay. And if you Google Artwork Archive and my name, it'll pop up. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, Gail wants to know, could you repeat the size of the linen warp you use? The size of my warp? Yeah. Um, it's an A5 linen. Okay. All right. And then somebody else said that they found um, the uh, Collingwood stuff on in the net, handweaving.net. So, good. 
we need to stop for the day. I can't believe it. Oh, it's been so much fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing with us about your work, your creativity approach and everything. It's been delightful. I, I can't wait to see more of what you're going to do. Well, thank you, Kathy, and thank you to HGA and to Michigan League as well being the sponsor. I really appreciate it. Yes, they, they have uh, been real troopers. They've been a big support to Textiles and Tea, and we do appreciate it. Um, and the other thing I want to remind people is that their 2022 workshop schedule is up. Registration is open. Um, they have some amazing people coming to teach. So check that out on their website, which is um mlhguild.org and that's our sponsor the michigan league of hand weavers um they've been a wonderful um sponsor for us for a variety of uh, programs carol thank you so much for being here today thank we you appreciate it. thanks to everybody that um took the time to watch it as well if you would like to sponsor an episode of Textiles and Tea or your business or your guild, please check out all the information on our website at weavespindie.org. Also, Textiles and Tea is supported by the generous donations to the Fiber Trust. If you would like to see more programming like this, um, some of the other programming that we've had, um, such as the Spinning and Weaving Week, the guild, um, retreat that we just had that was so popular. All of those are help sponsored um, through your donations and through your membership. Yeah, you can also sign up, you can become a member, you can donate at weavespindie.org. If you missed any of the episodes on Facebook or YouTube, you can see those on Facebook. You don't have to be a member. Um, you can go there and see any of the past episodes. We are also uploading them to YouTube, and I encourage you to subscribe to the uh, HGA YouTube page because um, you'll get a notice that a new episode has been uploaded, but also uh, we get money back from that, and it helps support Textiles and Tea Home our programming. Um, also to remind you that uh, deadlines are coming for the entries. Um, we've got grant applications is March 1st. We've changed them the deadline for some of these upcoming um, exhibits. Uh, Seasons of the Smoking, the wearable art has been moved to March 9th. Basketry, small expressions. I encourage you all to enter. Like I said, there's nothing more exciting than having your work at Convergent. It's just so much fun. We hope we'll see your work there. Um, next week, I'm really excited that um, we have Marcy Petrini. And just to note, that's a change. Um, we were supposed to have Mary Berry, but due to some unforeseen circumstances, Mary will have to be postponed till later. And Marcy Petrini, bless her little pumpkin heart, has agreed to step in. And so she'll be our guest next week. I also want to give a shout out to Mandy. We have a new employee named Mandy. <laughs> and she's been working so hard today. She's doing all of our um, slides today, and she's just been a real trooper. We're excited to have Mandy on board. So if you call in, be sure you say hi and you welcome her. Thank you so much for being here today. We do appreciate it. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next week and happy tea. <laughs>